Asia since 1938. Matson and the Adahi Tunnel Program. Cars Plus, home of Guam's first and only lifetime limited powertrain warranty. McDonald's of Guam, I'm loving it, and King's Restaurants. Always open, always local, and serving up favorites for over 40 years. Coming up on Primetime, over the weekend, Guam recorded two more COVID-related deaths. Plus, three sisters stuck in a GovGuam quarantine facility plead for their release. And restaurant and bar owners speak out about the tight restrictions and being treated unfairly. Half a day and good evening. I'm Adriana Cotero. Unfortunately, over the weekend, the island recorded its 51st and 52nd COVID-related casualties. A 90-year-old woman died on Saturday afternoon. According to the Joint Information Center, the woman was pronounced dead on arrival at the Guam Memorial Hospital at about 4.55 p.m. She had underlying health conditions and was a known COVID-positive case. Then on Sunday at approximately 1.30 p.m., a 66-year-old female with underlying health conditions that were compounded by COVID-19 was pronounced dead on arrival at GMH. The patient was swabbed upon arrival and her test yielded a positive result. The latest numbers released by the Joint Information Center on Saturday night, out of the latest 638 samples ran at various labs, 82 returned positive. This brings Guam's COVID case count to 2,699 island residents who have been infected. 761 people are actively fighting the virus, while more than 1,800 have recovered. According to Hospital Administrator Lillian Posadas, the current COVID census at the Guam Memorial Hospital shows 32 patients hospitalized, 13 needing an ICU level of care, and seven patients requiring ventilator support. We continue to urge the community to continue to practice social distancing, wash your hands, and wear your mask. You can help save a life by taking the necessary precautions. As we reported, there's been an increase in COVID positive pregnancies at the Guam Memorial Hospital. Sadly, one patient currently in the ICU will have to wake up to the news that her baby has passed. The facts are the individual came in um, with symptoms of respiratory distress, cough and fever. And yes, the initial test with the Abbott, uh, you know, came out negative. And it's possible that the virus load in her system was not sufficient when they did the swab, the Abbott uh, machine did not pick up on the virus uh, load, but in 12 hours, the, the, another swab was taken and submitted to public health and the PCR came back uh, positive. Hospital Administrator Lillian Posada says the patient continues to fight COVID-19. She adds that to date, there have been only two nosocomial COVID cases at GMH, the pregnant patient not being one of them. Again, the facts are, you know, you don't convert, uh, the individual did not catch the COVID in the hospital. Mm. So she came with the, the virus already. Currently, the patient remains in an ICU level of care. 17 nurses from the Guam Department of Education were tapped to provide the island's only public hospital with some much needed manpower. Unfortunately, things did not pan out like they hoped. Peter Santos has more. They were very much uh, concerned and, and willing to and interested to help, uh, you know, to respond to our call for, for help, and we tried. Of the 17 nurses from the Guam Department of Education chosen to aid GMH in their fight against COVID, only about eight remain. Hospital Administrator Lillian Posada says her talks with DOE Superintendent John Fernandez were fruitful, but things just didn't pan out. Many of them were still very anxious working in the hospital and, you know, more so working in a COVID hospital. Um, and so we felt that rather than really trying to force them to, to work here, when, when there, there are too many concerns and too many anxieties, you know, for the safety of the patients, uh, we didn't want them to feel forced uh, doing it. And at the same time, we didn't want to waste their time uh, getting them oriented and training when, you know, their desire and their heart and their mind is not really, well, you know, there for them to work in this hospital setting. Posada says that of the remaining DOE nurses, four are assigned to do contact tracing while others are assigned to the maternity ward. As for the eight school nurses that opted not to continue. The others who chose not to continue, uh, we went ahead and agreed to let them go to public health and help them out too, because public health needs help in terms of, you know, the outreach activities uh, that are, you know, that they're doing and the, uh, the testing and the tracing, contact tracing. 
So it worked out. Uh, but, you know, there's that uh, added uh, pool of nurses that can help out uh, within the healthcare system of the island. So it, there was no hamper at all. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Peter Santos. This next story is a heart-wrenching one, as three sisters stuck in a GovGuam quarantine facility plead with the government for compassion and understanding, having just lost a sister days ago and then given false hope for release to home quarantine. Here's more. If there's ever a time for compassion and understanding of a situation, it's right now. Kelsey Vargo, Jill Braithwaite, and Holly Mantano's sister, Jamie Ellis, suddenly passed away last week. And within minutes, these three sisters booked a flight from the States to Guam. It's devastating news to lose a sister so unexpectedly and to have been so far away from her and to not be able to be with her children right now. Um, it's just, it's, it's unbearable. Ellis passed away from an unrelated COVID-19 illness. She moved to Guam three months ago with her husband Preston and their three children. Upon hearing the devastating news, the three sisters applied for a hardship exemption in hopes of quarantining at Ellis's home. When we arrived at the airport on Friday, Friday evening, Guam time, um, we were met with a worker, co-workers of our brother-in-law who had said um, the governor sends her condolences and um, they're working with the Department of Public Health director to um, expedite our request and administer COVID tests and allow us to um, go be with uh, my sister's children and her husband. Despite being told at the airport by government personnel that they would be administered COVID-19 testing the next morning, now days later, and they still have not been tested. And their exemption request has since been denied. So we were just waiting for our our COVID test um, and about 48 hours into our stay here, we received word that um, our request had been denied um, and that we would need to stay in the government quarantine facility for the six days, um, which unfortunately that day six is um, our anticipated return back to the States when we hope to take um, our sister's children back with us. According to the sisters, the Department of Public Health denied the request because a memorial has not been scheduled for Ellis. If you want the definition of heart wrenching, that's it. Um, to be so close but unable to be there physically with them. Thursday of this week is day six, when the sisters may test out of the mandatory quarantine. Although Kelsey, Jill and Holly remain hopeful that they will be able to hold their sister's children before then and mourn together with their family. We're reaching out to as many people as we can to try and get a test and then um, get granted to quarantine at her home. That would be our wish. Um, however, if it doesn't happen, we'll change our flights and we'll stay on the island days longer and um, be there for those kids. On behalf of KUAM, our most heartfelt condolences to Jamie Ellis's family. May she rest in peace. Restaurants and bars remain under tight restrictions with indoor dining still prohibited. Popular establishments like Mosa's Joint and Care Bob Brewing believe it's unfair that other industries can operate more freely than they can, even though their industry is being just as diligent in sticking to health and safety protocols. Mosa's co-owner, Monique Amani. I believe that the restaurant business and the bars and everything, I think that they're all following the guidelines too. And if they aren't, then they should get shut down. And, you know, I, I understand where the governor is coming from completely about um, being safe because the cases have spiked so tremendously the last month and a half. But um, I also feel like this is detrimental to all of our livelihood, you know? Care about brewing owner Ann Johnson says they're fortunate to have space for outdoor dining, but it's the ever-changing rules that are making it hard for businesses like hers. It's detrimental to the business to have to guess what you're going to do four days from now. Um, do we buy more produce? Do we not? Um, so that's been really tricky. For us, we have the distinct advantage of having that outdoor area. Um, I fought for that back in May, June, and July. I went through the paperwork. I went to multiple agencies multiple times. 
Um, I had the support of my landlord, which was incredible. Um, and so I have that opportunity, but I fought for that for months. They are hopeful that restrictions will be further eased soon. They say they're not asking for special treatment, but rather it's a matter of survival and keeping their employees employed. Island Beverage Distributors and Tito's Handmade Vodka are partnering with local restaurants to lift spirits. They will be distributing over 400 meals to F&B workers that have been adversely affected due to the pandemic through their Friends for Food program. IBD brand manager, Kimberly Gogui. Hey, there's a meal on us, um, and there's five different restaurants to choose from with two options per restaurant. The program is being facilitated through the brand's philanthropic arm, Love Tito's. They like to make this joke that they are a philanthropic company that sell vodka on the side because their main mission, aside from selling vodka, is to spread love and goodness anywhere they can. In addition to the Tito's Food for Friends program, they are also launching a retail promotion. For every 750 milliliter bottle that you purchase at Payless 76 Circle K, Foodies or an ABC store, $1 will be donated to a charity. By a 175 liter bottle, $2 will be donated. Food distribution will be held Thursday, October 8th and next Tuesday, October 13th. To register for Friends for Food, email Kimberly Gogui at kgogui at midpackguam.com. Stick around for more news here on Primetime. You're watching KUAM. Social distancing may be the new norm, but connection will always be our tradition. Through good times and tough times, we remain connected with you. Mass may be the new fashion, but protection will always be our style. You can always count on us to protect the things that matter the most. Sanitizing may be the new routine, but caring will always be our practice. We care about your loved ones and the things you value the most. And as we welcome our new normal, one thing remains certain, we will always be here for you. We're open and ready to serve you. Calvo's Insurance, a legacy of trust. It makes myself and it makes my team members very proud to work for an organization that has been on Island for many years with its focus on reliability, dependability, and commitment to the communities that they operate in. Matson's a great corporate citizen to the community. We all benefit from any sort of environmental commitment we make. One of the ways that we do that is with our Adahi Utano program. There's action behind it, and so action breeds commitment. With the Kaimana Gila coming to Guam, this brings a new age and modernization to the island. It's exciting for me because it's a brand new ship and we can carry more freight into the islands. It just shows growth for Guam and Micronesia. Matson would be nothing without its customers and we hope to continue to serve you for decades to come. going out each day, doing what they can to hold us all together. We're here to help those helping us all by keeping our lights on. KUAM News, winner of the 2020 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Social Media. Welcome back. News from District Court now. Former Zonia Mayor Jesse Bloss' sentencing hearing is expected to take the entire day of Friday, November 6th. It was in September of last year Bloss was arrested for allowing drug trafficking through village cluster boxes. He has since pled guilty to one count of extortion and faces a maximum imprisonment of 20 years. This afternoon, both parties met for a joint status hearing in Chief Judge Francis Hidinko Gatewood's courtroom. It was stated that both the government and the defense plan to call up the government's informant, Brenda Kinian, to testify. And based on COVID-19 restrictions and quarantine requirements, Kenyan's arrival flight lands on October 18th. 
with her being released by, from quarantine by November 2nd. Additionally, during the sentencing hearing, the government plans to have two case agents testify and will play lengthy videos turned into evidence. Bureau Director Ray Tapasna says it's a case of crying wolf. Tapasna spoke on the link this morning to clear things up with the recent controversy on his pay raise and the possibility of third-party receivership. Our Peter Santos reports. Well, that's entirely up to the board. Guru Director Ray Tapasha is sticking to his guns regarding his controversial pandemic pay raise. Tapasha maintains that the board simply did what they're legally obligated to do. The board ratified uh, a salary increment uh, tied to my performance evaluation. I believe there's a board meeting this Friday. Yeah, there is a board meeting this Friday. And, you know, it's entirely up to the board. They were they fully conform to Gura's personnel rules and regs. In previous reports, Tapasha said that rescinding the salary increments for both himself and the deputy would be a violation of Gura's personnel rules and regulations. Guam's public auditor BJ Cruz told KOM that the director's salary was unwarranted because they're not certified technical professionals, but rather political hacks. Director Tapasha says the pay comes with the risk involved. To suggest that none of us are qualified, that we're just political hacks is uh it is really uh, unfortunate that anyone would make that suggestion because the bottom line is we're responsible for, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in my particular case in federal grants. So if I'm signing off on things that are not proper or inappropriate, then the feds are going to hold me to account like they did the previous administration. The recent OPA audit of Gura had public auditor Cruz concerned with the possibility of receivership saying that the audit doesn't speak well of the management. Director Tapasha says that he's got the proof to back up his stance on the matter. I have documents to show uh, complete, the complete opposite. We're not at the verge of a third party receivership. That's more crying wolf and there's no wolf to suggest that we have a bad audit when, when Deloitte and Touche did the audit and did a presentation to the board and said something completely opposite. Again, more crying wolf. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Peter Santos. Making significant strides financially for the past decade, the Guam Department of Education is on the brink of being relieved from the third-party fiduciary, and now the board moves to be rid of another oversight. Back in 2010, in response to high-risk status, Guam Law created the Education Supervisory Financial Commission, or the EFSC requirement. Now the GEB feels it's unnecessary, as Vice Chair Mark Mendiola explains, the department has had clean audits for the past six years in a row. We requested that uh you know, the legislature look into this law again and see whether or not the Department of Education really needs this uh, uh, supervisory commission to um, uh, to oversee the finances of the Department of Education. I can say that, uh, you know, we got a set of eyes and the board, the whole group is, is uh, looking at the finances of, of, of our department at, at, at this point. As we reported, GDOE's fiscal year 2021 budget was cut by $15.1 million. Mindiola, who joined KUAM on the link this morning, adds that the board is preparing for the challenges surprised. ahead. You know, we've been yeah. telling them, we've been warning folks saying, hey, uh, there's an impending storm coming, a financial storm that could potentially really uh, jeopardize or hurt the Department of Education uh, mission. And that's to provide a quality education to our island community, our public school kids. You can watch the full interview on KUAM's YouTube channel. Anticipating the upcoming transitions, Guam education heads met with the legislature this morning for an informational briefing to share their upcoming plans once relieved from the high-risk status. GDOE Superintendent John Fernandez. One of the focal points for, for us in that strategy is our internal audit office. So the internal audit office, which had a much narrower scope when I first came in, is now you know, uh, a larger, a little bit larger, definitely stronger and definitely aligned with the high risk areas. Uh, so they've been really critical in this improvement strategy. And so one of the focal points of our transition effort is to look within um, the internal audit office to ensure that that's the functions that can be transitioned there uh, to provide that uh, monitoring and review uh, for the organization can reside there. And then other than that, you know, we are looking at our various business and finance functions to make sure that we have adequate capacity in terms of people who are um, hired and trained to transition from the third party. Fernandez also provided an update on the allocation for CARES Act funding. As of September 30th, 65.5% or $41.5 million of the total Education Stabilization Fund State Education Agency Grant Award has been expended for with a priority on distance learning technology tools. 
Serve up fire safety in the kitchen is this year's theme for Fire Prevention Week, which is from October 4th to the 10th. A virtual proclamation ceremony was held on Friday with Governor Lou Leon Guerrero, Lieutenant Governor Josh Chenorio, community stakeholders and representatives from the local and federal fire agencies. Guam Fire Department Acting Fire Chief Alex with Castro. The pandemic crisis happening right now, Fire Prevention Week must continue, more especially during the time while most people are at home. And when more people are at home, of course, uh, more cooking is being done at home. So this year's prevention theme, prevention week theme, does not come at a better time than now. According to Chief Castro, unattended cooking is the leading cause of house fires and home fire injuries. To protect homes and loved ones, residents should ensure that homes have working smoke alarms and evacuation plans in place. One of Guam's big three telecom com companies has just gotten bigger. ITNE announced today it is acquiring the telecommunication assets of iConnect Guam. These include iConnect's wireless networks and push to talk customer base. In a statement, ITNE CEO Jim Olerking said, quote, the acquisition will allow us to continue with our improvements to our network coverage and data capabilities in Guam and the CNMI. iConnect has been serving the island communities for more than 20 years and is a pioneer in the local telecommunications industry, unquote. iConnect took over Motorola's mobile radio network in 1999. ITNE says subscribers' phone numbers will remain the same and will be advised if a SIM card replacement is required. Customers should also continue to pay their bills and seek assistance online at iConnect website. Jack in the Box will open a second restaurant on Guam. The national fast food chain announced that a new freestanding store will be built at the corner of Marine Drive and Haliguac Way in Tamuni, at the site of the old Pizza Hut restaurant. Completion is expected by the end of next year. The restaurant will feature one of its largest designs to accommodate indoor dining and a drive through According to Donna Yano, Vice President of Jack in the Box Hawaii, says, we are pleased to announce our further investment in Guam, which we know can help support the local economy and provide more career opportunities for the residents in the long term. Jack in the Box opened here in 2014 and currently has one outlet at the Shell gas station near the Micronesia Mall. More primetime news when we return. Your community calendar is brought to you by Taco Bell. Whether it's your first meal or your fourth meal, we've got you covered. Taco Bell, live mas. Hafidei Guam, this is Telu Tidy Wee. Fighting for you has been my honor, regardless of the politics and the challenges we face. I've worked hard every day to improve GMH facilities, fund security cameras for public safety, support road repairs, and call out legislation and decisions that break the people's trust in government. The fight for these priorities isn't over. It's just begun. I'm Talo Tairi. I approve this message and humbly ask for your vote. Situ Smasi, Maraman Salamat Po. Thank you, Wong. You could upgrade to the sparkly sprinkle pack on Cupcake Conquest. Or you could upgrade to all this. Two crunchy tacos and a medium drink. Plus the beefy cheesy layers of the Grande Stacker Box. Only at Taco Bell. Welcome back. Dave Delgado catches up with local NFL fans in the Fanatic Zoom Zone and talks their love of the game and predictions for the season. Dave Delgado here for Fanatic Zoom Zone. With me today, Frankie Paris, reps the San Francisco 49ers. Now, tell us when the love for your team first started. You know, it started um, when I was a kid, six years old. I, I the first team that was ever introduced to me was the San Francisco 49ers. I went out to uh, 
go visit my family in the in the Bay Area. And my uncle just gave me a 49ers jacket. I didn't know what it was, who it was, what the heck I was wearing, but it, it was nice and shiny and golden. And that was it. Which team do you look forward to facing every season? Always division rivals. Of course, right now it's the Seahawks, but uh, I always look forward to the Cardinals games. Uh, I know what I know. What team I don't want to see is the Cowboys. Top two all-time players. Of course, uh, number sixteen got to be Joe Montana, and uh, forty-two Ronnie Lott. Make sure to catch some NFL action right here on the stations of KUAM. Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. on KUAM TV 11, NFL on CBS, the New England Patriots at the Kansas City Chiefs. Coming up, your birthday shout out. Keep it here. Want a real taste of New York? The Big New Yorker is back with a big, bold taste and a sweet marinara sauce on a crust that's 30% larger than our large. Handmade to perfection, it's just $9.99 per carryout. The Big New Yorker, only at your island pizza hut. 100% truck, 100% Jeep brand. The all-new Jeep Gladiator is the most capable off-road mid-size pickup truck crafted for adventure. Equipped with best-in-class towing capacity, legendary Jeep brand 4x4 capability, and backed by Guam's only lifetime powertrain warranty. Drive home in a brand new Jeep Gladiator today, starting as low as $283 per paycheck during Jeep Adventure Days. Call us at 477-7807 or visit our website at carsplusguam.com to get pre-approved today. And before we close out the news tonight, our latest round of birthday shout outs from the Cold Stone Creamery Birthday Club. Happy birthday to Ben Lozano, who celebrates birthday number 93 today. Happy birthday, Papa Ben. Wishing you a great birthday with lots of love, laughter, and joy. Nova Jones, happy birthday to you from Hubby and Maxi Boy. Francine Jenna Cruz Kitachai, happy birthday to my daughter slash mom slash sister, aka Jenna and Chubbs. Wishing you lots of blessings, guidance, hope, and a healthier mind on your special day. Enjoy and stay safe. We love you, say Mom and Jewel, children Frankie, Avery, Jojo, and Bubba, Bro King Art, and Sis Nene. Frank Bigler, happy birthday to you from your GW Gecko family. Today's your special day, so forget life's troubles and have a blast with your mask on, of course. Great shout out. Therese Sanchez, happy birthday and much joy and happiness coming your way. Stay safe, sister. Say your friends and family. Roy Pareto, happy birthday from your gecko family as well. Your smiling eyes tell it all. Enjoy your special day. Hugs to you and Jackie. Noah John Kanata Rosalind celebrates birthday number big 2 And to our son, we are incredibly proud of you. Many blessings to you today and always. Love dad, mom, and your brothers. Herman Guerrero celebrates a birthday today, and the man known to his friends and family as Joey gets an abundance of birthday blessings. Viva cumpleaños! We love you plenty. And happy belated birthday wishes going out to Joaquin Flores and Tatum Matthew. Happy birthday to the father and son duo. Kin was born on the second, Tatum born on the first from the family. Audrey Ujoa Apligui, born on October 2nd. Happy birthday, Odd. We love you, say Steph, Joni, and Ness. Daniel Woodward, happy birthday number 11 to my sunshine, S-O-N, sunshine, get it? That's very creative, awesome. You are mommy's amazing blessing, enjoy your special day. There's more wordplay, I love you. That's a great shout out. Donovan Leon Gurel has a birthday today. Donovan was born on October 3rd. Happy birthday to you, you continue to make us proud. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay happy. You are so loved, always dad and mom. Gus Tyron, happy birthday to a very special nephew. AKA, hey guy, your shyness and thoughtfulness bring joy to your siblings. Happy birthday, guy. Love your wife, Christy, mom and dad, and the crew, Sablon, Tyron, Fam Bam. Dr. Patricia Timinglow celebrates a birthday today, and Doc was born on the 4th. From, again, your GW Gecko family, we wish you another great day in your life to be filled with joy and laughter. And happy birthday number 15 to Holly Derby, born on the 4th. May all your wishes come true. We love you forever. Whew. That's a lot of Guamanians who had a birthday today, and you know what? Each and every one of them is awesome. Happy birthday to you all. Remember, you can be part of the Cold Stone Creamery Birthday Club by registering online on KUAM.com. Please make sure to include with your photo your name and birthday. That's going to do it for us here on Prime Time. Thanks for watching. Have a good night and be safe.
Alpha Day and welcome to KUAM News Extra. I'm Joanna Charfres, filling in for Andy Wheeler. Thank you so much for tuning in. You know, we have a great show coming up today. Um, you know, one of the things I love about Guam is our local businesses and how they always step up and, um, you know, help out and assist the community in their times of need. And Triple J Enterprises is, is definitely one of them. And so I'm so excited to have three lovely ladies joining me today. I have Tina Estevez from a Triple J, the marketing manager. I have, uh, <laughs> and I also have the uh, daughter and granddaughter of the late Margaret Jones. And so honored that they are joining us as well in this, uh, in this interview. I have Julie Jones Morrow and Jessica Jones Madrid. Half a day, ladies. Half a day. Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for taking the time out to sit and chat with me. I was uh, excited about doing this interview because, you know, being in, in news for close to a decade, you know, I know that um, Triple J Enterprises has been one of the businesses that um, has and continues uh, to assist the community during uh, times of need. and. And especially now during this COVID chaos, you know, um, it's even um, more uh, amazing to see like businesses coming out and, and assisting the community. Um, I first wanted to um, talk about the um, projects that you have going on, especially during this time. And we'll definitely get into like the drive, the motivation and the inspiration behind um, the efforts that Triple J Enterprises does. Um, Tina, if you wanted to kind of jump in and, and kind of um, explain, I guess, um, the concept and, and, and how it, you know, the turnout was. Yeah, so um, actually we are going to, um, um, the, the barbecue, the drive through barbecue that we, we put on just a couple of weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago was Outback Steakhouse, and then this week was uh, Red, this past week was Red Lobster. So Triple J's um, philosophy has always been customers first, and it's ingrained in our DNA that we um, always give back to our community. So in this current pandemic time that we're living through right now, um, it kind of just heightened our, our need and our want to give back to the community that we serve um, as, as a company. So uh, when when things were happening, and it, it actually since the beginning, since March, we've uh, partnered with many different organizations to um, give back. We've given back to healthcare workers, frontline frontline workers as well. Um, the Manamku, we partnered up with Kudu Cares uh, back then. Um, so we just wanted to continue that trend, right, and let them know that we, you know, we're still here for the community, uh, and we're all uh, working together to get through these unprecedented times. So that was kind of the um, idea behind the barbecue giving back. Um, the Red Lobster and Outback Steakhouse teams wanted to do something more. They wanted to join forces, and, and um, it was it was uh, it was buy buy a plate and give a plate. Um, so what it was is you would come through and you would buy a barbecue plate and you would support the cause, and then we would give we would feed the healthcare workers um, at these at the, the different facilities. Um, just to let them know that we care, that we thank them for all their hard work and being out there in the front lines and helping to protect our community. Um, so that that was the start of the barbecue. Uh, but this is all part of uh, a bigger project that I want uh, Jessica and Julie to talk about because it was more than just the barbecue. Um, it was a huge thing uh, that was, it's, it's uh, very, very dear to Mrs. Jones. Jessica, if, or, or even um, Julie, if there's something that you wanted to, to say about the, because I know that, um, like you were mentioning, Tina, like the driving force and the, and the, just the whole idea of helping the community, you know, came, or is, you know, the motivation was from um, Mrs. Jones. And, and, you know, I didn't have the uh, privilege of meeting her in person, but I can tell you that from friends and, and coworkers, they have nothing but the sweetest things to say about her. And it just speaks to the woman she was. Definitely, and I'm getting teary eyed. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, you know, kind of, I think one way that this evolved as far as the, um, well, we're, call we're calling it the Mima project, was um, as far as 
placing the red hearts around GMH and GRMC was um, just, I actually saw this on TikTok that the um, Vancouver Island in Canada was doing this around their hospitals. And for a long time now, weeks and weeks, um, I've been thinking like, you know, what could we do to encourage the hospital staff? Um, you know, I knew that my mom would want us to do something. And I was, my mom had care, taken care of at GMH several times. And, you know, from the hospital doctors to the nursing staff, to the maintenance people that would come into her room, she always had excellent care there. And she had care in other places, you know, on the East Coast, you know, big name hospitals, but really the care she had at GMH over the years, and especially one time in particular when she was very ill, was, um, you know, it, it was just as good, if not better, than the care that she got in other places. And I knew that, you know, she would want something done, especially when the hospital started to fill up. And we were getting the reports about how many were in the ICU. And then, and then when we started having more and more deaths, um, I think that's when I was really burdened to, you know, try to do something that the staff would at least know because you feel pretty helpless, you know, um, out in the community when you're not a medical provider uh, yourself, you feel pretty helpless as far as what can you do. So I just thought, you know, what would mom want us to do? And I thought, well, she would want them to know that they're very appreciated, that, you know, um, the communities behind them, that we might not 